I am really excited to be talking to you today, Len. Uh, let me, I gotta give a little history because this is cool. I, I, I get saved. I come back to the church. I'm frustrated that the church isn't telling the story as much as it, it needs to, as, as, as fully as it needs to. And I complain about it for a year. Well, then I hear of this, this conference, really a day workshop of these people that can, can breathe life in the church. And, and I'm like, oh, someone else that understands and feels the pain that I've seen and things of that sort. So it's so exciting because you were the man that uh, you, you and Jason were running that. And I tell you, it was really, really cool. It was because it was seriously, it was like, am I the only one? Why doesn't anyone see this? I mean, this is back whew, a long time ago um, where churches didn't have church marketing people. They, they, right. there was nobody on their staff. It was, you know, probably the assistant to the assistant that was taking care of stuff, you know? And so it was, it's such a cool, and now I get to, get to be here. And, and, and it used to be, we could have lunch together cause we were both in Atlanta. You were at Peachtree. I was at victory. And now, now we're both in Texas a little further away, but, uh, now we're both you're back in Texas. Is Texas home for you originally? Texas. Uh, well, I've, I've lived a lot of places, but uh, <laughs> middle school, high school, college. And then in my thirties, when I was running midnight oil, when we first met, yeah. uh, those were all Texas years. So yeah, Texas is the, the home state by virtue of most years, I guess. That's, that is great. Um, all right. So now you are <laughs> digging into invite resources. Talk to me about that. It, and like, give me the origin story because this is this is your origin story, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, from the the time we first met, that was like um, oh three or something. Yeah. Two or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I had been I had begun writing and speaking around the use of uh, screens in worship and worship and communicating the gospel more interestingly and more effectively, uh, and I had begun writing mostly for the United Methodist Publishing House. Uh, had yeah. nine titles, did all this history with them from as an author. And then I went to work there inside that house in Nashville in the Christian publishing industry for a bit and oh, yeah. um, discovered a lot of kind of frustrations about how Christian publishing was working. And at, at first I thought it was just me. You know, I was just like, <laughs> I, you know, I just don't understand this. But but then I got inside there and I realized that I acquired 55 books. My, my title was Senior Acquisitions Editor over Leadership. And so I acquired a lot of books and to a person, everybody was saying the same things that I had said. Yeah. Like it was like publishing is a black hole. You just, you send something in, you don't know what happens. No one markets the book. No one helps me cultivate what I'm doing. No one cares about the platforming. They want you to already be platformed. It's like this weird catch 22. Like yeah. they won't publish you unless you're platform, they don't <laughs> help you platform, you right. know, and all this kind of weird stuff. And so, um, you know, I, I left there in, in 2012 to go to work at Peach Street in Atlanta, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Um, and then came uh, back home to Texas in 2016 in a, in a role uh, as a creative director for a large Methodist church here in Plano called St. Andrew. In fact, that's the. Yeah. Uh, the oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. And um, but from the, the day I, I joined staff, one of the associates there had also published a couple of times. And so we we commiserated over how bad Christian publishing is. And um <laughs> And it just talked about how we would do it better. And then in 2018, we were invited to um, consult on this panel for this. Kind of, it was going to be a competitor to Right Now Media that was going to launch. Oh, and we were going to yeah. do some things. And so um, we were on this panel. And basically, everything we said not to do, they wanted to do everything we said do. They didn't want to do it. And we were like, it cannot be this hard. And so we came right. back and we were like, we really need to start something. Day to day, you know how it goes. And so yeah. then we're moving along. And then we get to, to COVID. And yes, first day of shelter in place was Friday the 13th, 2020. It was like the, you know, the end of the world. Right. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Uh, we, we talked to one another that day. And then that Monday made the decision. We we're like, let's, let's start this thing. There's no better time yeah. than, than this time because no one's going to do anything. And I could just dive in and focus on, on this new startup. And so we did that. So we like to say that while the world pressed pause, we pressed play yeah. and we yeah. just went for it and did a new startup and, and uh, have been rolling since. So now it's two years and a quarter that we've been That's going. That's great. Out. I mean, as hard as as hard as COVID was, and 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 still continues to 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 be a pain in everyone's side, it also brought some really neat opportunities. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of things grow out of that. You know, it's so desperate time. Desperate times be desperate measures. You're like, all right, you know what? 
everything else is falling apart. Let's just go into it. If we're going to fail, let's fail now. And so it's really cool by people digging into that and just saying, let's go. Let's use this as an opportunity to start a new business, to, to write a new book or whatever the types it is. You know, all the churches that are going online, all that kind of stuff. But so that's yeah. it, what, a, what a great opportunity to be able to start. So how starting starting something like this, what are some of the initial hurdles that you had to get over? Well, we publishing, a lot of people said the timing is kind of interesting, but they were like, why would you get into publishing? Because, you know, no one wants to read books. And, and there's a level at which they're right. Uh, we, we did a survey once at Abingdon that uh, the average, this was 90,000 people on this mailing list. And, and we, we learned that the average uh, church leader uh, bought 11 books a year and read two of them. It's so... <laughs> That's not a good return. No. <laughs> so we're like, I mean, I, there is this phenomenon. I don't know if you've ever done this, Michael, but I'll buy a book and it'll sit on my nightstand for three months. And I think I've read it because I've been staring at the cover the whole time, right. but I actually yeah. haven't. Yeah. You know? So so we were kind of joking about that. We were saying, you know, there's definitely this trend. But on the other hand, if you look at, at stats at the broader level, like Publisher Weekly stats and New York Times stats that actually show book sales and book readership is up over the last oh. two to three years. Okay. So just okay. like how eBooks we're going to take over, but then print came back. It's kind of the same phenomenon. I do think yeah. people still value and love the experience of a tactile book. Um, so, th so there's that. That's, that's kind of one of the hurdles we began to ask. And we really felt like it's a, it's a both and thing. The, the biggest yeah. need though, is that there, there is a need, especially in our kind of Methodist or larger Wesleyan tradition, mm -hmm. there's a huge need for a new platform for ideas. Yeah. Uh, like, like if you look on the reform side of our, like the Protestant, actually at a, at a much broader level, I'd say in American life, what I like to say is that you divide religion into four quarters. A fourth of the, of the country is the, are the nuns and the duns. They don't yeah. care anymore or they never cared, you know, they're yeah. just nothing, you know, whatever. And then you have a fourth that are Roman Catholic in their orientation, either they attend church or don't or whatever. Right. And then a quarter are more reformed Protestant, and then a quarter are the Wesleyan Protestants. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all their because okay. each each one of those buckets have tons of denominations. More right? more buckets within them. Yeah. 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 Now the the reform side have the Gospel Coalition. They have this amazing site. Four million hits a month. Uh, go to this oh, wow. this site. Lots of attention. Very formed. Very kind of structured. And I would characterize, and there might be some some reform listeners who can make me better at this, <laughs> I'm going to say, but, but I would say that the, the, a lot of the reformed theological, the worldview is the life of the mind, like helping to understand theologically what's happening in scripture and mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, that whole thing. Whereas the Wesleyan view is more, more like lived, more right. practical, you know, how do you live like Jesus? And, and there's really no kind of central space for that. And so we said, we need that. And, and the press is our, our first pillar to start that out. And so we're starting to put out books monthly. Now we'll do two books a month starting in the fall. And then our second pillar is, is going to be um, kind of that, that online hub of content yeah. to help people understand what it means to, to live like Jesus yeah. in, in a very practical kind of way. That's exciting. That's really exciting. Now you, you mentioned the process of writing a book and how you guys are doing it differently. It was kind of interesting. You know, we, you and I talked couple of weeks ago and about maybe doing a book myself and things like that. So I've never written a book. I can write, but I've never done a book. And I, I was really taken in by, by the process that you, you, you really follow. So talk to us a little bit about that. One of the things that I discover when the edit with the editor had on, uh, someone told me one time early on, I've been at the publishing house like three or four months and they said, you're a cultivator. And I couldn't tell if they meant that as a compliment or a slam. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know, like, I don't know how this works. I just, you know, I'm trying to work with people. And yeah. and, and what I re learned was that a lot of people in publishing are kind of passive. And, you know, that what they what they like to do is they like to sit and wait for a perfect proposal to appear. And so it's got, uh, it meets a need. The person's got a platform. They can write well, all these things. Yeah. And I was like, that doesn't really happen. It's it's very <laughs> difficult to find that. And and so I, what I like to say is there's three things I look for. I look for somebody with something to say, uh, the writing chops to say it, and then the platform to stand on. Now, in the traditional publishing world, the only one of those that's non-negotiable is the platform. Right. And in our world, for me, it's something to say, because yeah. I don't want to just publish books to make money. That's not the goal right. here, right? Yeah. The goal is to change lives. And so give me something, somebody with something to say, and then we can help cultivate the writing chops and the platform building. Yeah. That is yeah. very different than traditional publishing, because traditional publishers don't get behind the platforming until after. So 
the way that works, so like Harper Collins and Zondervan are kind of the two biggest yep. Christian imprints. They both have yep. purchased by Harper. Uh, I said that wrong. Nelson and Zondervan are the two biggest imprints. And they, they both have purchased. Yeah, and they both have purchased by Harper, and they work on a bestseller model. So the way that works is they have five hundred plus titles a year, like literally one to two a day. They're just chunking them all out, Ooh. and maybe five to ten of those, one to two percent, might organically kind of take off. Right. And it's not until after that happens that they put any marketing money behind it. Wow. I mean, unless you're Stephen King and they right. just yeah. you're gonna pre order, you know, <laughs> yeah. five hundred thousand, then otherwise they don't. And and you look at some of the biggest titles in publishing, Christian publishing in this century, like Blue Like Jazz, for example, that right. was three years on the market before it took off, just all word of mouth wow. uh, right. before before it happened. So um, that the model there is is just turn and burn content, content, yeah. content. And then if you hit a couple of them that go, then those become the tent poles that that feed everybody and keep the business running. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, the, the average book in that, you know, the, the, the rest of the world, right? You got these couple that are doing great. Right. You got the right. rest of it. That average is really low. So in <laughs> Publishers yeah. Weekly says the average nonfiction title does 500 copies a lifetime. Uh, New York Times says 2000. So somewhere between there, like basically, <laughs> you know, not much, right? Right. So we're like, wow, you could you could beat that average easily with a little bit of attention to uh, say you've got somebody who's in a network already, they, they market to their network, they do a good job with launch, you yeah. can beat that average at launch by launch. Yeah. So we're like, let's focus on good ideas to people who are actively in in ministry or in the world in some capacity, you know, in their right. job. Yeah. And, and help them get their books out. And at that very low level, you don't have to have the Stephen Kings of the world to make right. it work, yeah. right? You yeah. Just, yeah. So that's kind of one of the ways that we're trying to, and that, that means being in a relationship. It means understanding who you're working with. It's not yeah. transactional. To me, it's more yeah. covenantal. Yeah. I like to yeah. say we publish people, not products. I like to get to know Ooh, who you good. are, what you're about, and then we come alongside. And if it's a good fit, we, we're in ministry together. I see it as a long-term partnership. Yeah. And it's not just, okay, I got my first book in, now I'm people know about me now I'm going to bail on you're like no we did this together so we're going to continue to do this together and you kind of you've earned that right to keep yes. going for the next yes. one you know yes yeah. and what's happening yeah. is that we're it to we, it do, <laughs> what we like what we said early on Michaels we said how would you do publishing the kingdom of heaven and one of those things was ultimately it's about relationships yeah. and and just speaking with a purely business hat on for a second like if you do it well anybody who's been in business and successfully understands it's all about relationships, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. our our authors have enjoyed this experience so much. They're bringing their networks to us, and we're we're exponentially growing because they're saying this is different than any other publishing experience we've ever had. Everybody That's wants huge. to be a part. And I've I had forty proposals last. I've never one well one time on my Facebook wall I asked for proposals because <laughs> I was frustrated about discipleship. But but other than right. that, I've never asked for proposals. And last two weeks ago we had forty in a week. Wow. Um, that came in. So that's just all word of mouth and networking that's happening. Through your through your relationships that you have and, and people know that, hey, you know, this is a different way to do things. That's I, I, it is interesting. Um, good friend Matt Nisey wrote a book and I don't remember who was publishing it, mostly because they kind of the same thing. They didn't do a whole lot. It was a fantastic book. Uh, Matt's brilliant. But it is yeah. it is. A, I love to of focusing more not on becoming rich over selling a book. Cause I think anyone that wants to become rich by writing a book is going to be very, very, very disappointed. <laughs> That's right. But if you've got a message and you want to get it out there, I love that that is the core of, of what you guys are looking for and doing. And that's, yeah, that's uh, that really makes all the difference, especially in, in the faith world. Like we've got something that that's put inside of us that, that God wants to get out of us. And they're like, okay, yes. let's, let's do that. Let's get it out of, out of you and, and things of that sort. Yes. Now yeah. it, it, it is interesting. It's called invite resources, not invite publishing. How come? That's right. Yeah. Yep. Invite. We, so the reason is that it, that's an umbrella. So invite resources is the title over several pillars. So yep. invite press is the first pillar. We're now entering our third year. Invite yep. media is our second pillar, which we're in the process of launching this calendar year. Yeah. And then we have opportunities to do other things. I, I've got crazy visions, Michael. I'm thinking about uh -huh. invite events, invite conferences, yep. invite films. Uh, um, so yeah, all of those things down the road as, as God leads, but yeah, we're starting with the press. And the reason I started with the press is because I think writing is the only medium that forces you to think deeply enough that you really do have original ideas to contribute in the end. Mm. 
Uh, now, now, part of this idea comes from, um, and that may be a bit of an overstatement, but as a writer, I'm going to kind of stick with that. Uh, and, and part <laughs> of that kind of comes with uh, my experience. Like, I used to be a huge Malcolm Gladwell fan. Still like yeah. him okay, but I don't follow everything the way I used to. And and the shift for me happened. I'd read several of his books, like Outliers and Tipping Point, and I was then I was listening to his um, Revisionist History podcast. Mm. And then I got, I thought, oh, new book coming out, Bomber Mafia. This is going to be great. I love Gladwell books. I bought it, and I was actually a little disappointed, Michael. It was, mm. it, it felt like a series of podcast episodes that were then put uh, into the book. Yeah, uh, and it felt like the podcast was driving the writing, but it's really hard to to get in depth in short form media, right? Like like long form yeah. content, like books allows you to kind of really explore topics and come up with new solutions. Um, and then out of that comes everything else. And so uh, and that's, I mean, like I said, that's probably an overstatement, not fair to, to either Malcolm or to a lot of people, but but I'm, I'm convinced that writing is critical uh, yeah. to that. And so we've started the press for that purpose. That's Led great. With so what are what are some exciting projects that you are even working on right now or that you see coming up? Sure. Well, we're currently doing one a month. Uh, we're starting with two a month in the fall. One, uh, Several great projects on tap. Uh, one, a couple that your readers might uh, or your listeners might know about. Uh, Lynn Sweet and I are co-writing a book. Uh, in Ooh, fact, I'm, nice. uh, I'm, I'm doing the uh, the last read on the manuscript right now. He just sent it back to me a couple of days ago, and it's called The Fantastic. End. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, the subtitle is the present age and the age to come. So we're, we're taking on kind of like what's happening in the world today, like, like kind of just analyzing everything from the perspective of faith. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I'm so excited. Talk about, about timely. Yeah. Oh, I, oh yeah. It's, it's going to be a good one. So we're doing that. We're doing a, a project with Steve Snyder who, uh, runs authentic manhood. Yeah. So this was the largest men's ministry program of the last 20 plus years. We're doing a new book with him comes out in the spring. Uh, Greg Atkinson, who runs First Impressions oh, yeah. Conference, yeah, know, uh, yep, doing one with him. Uh, several projects that are coming down the road uh, that are, we, we've got to got these categories. We've got a, a lot of uh, our submissions and inquiries and conversations are around healing and wholeness. It's kind of a hot topic right now in terms of like, not just mental health, but just kind of understanding brokenness and healing. Uh, so we're doing a lot on that. We're doing a lot on um, on theology, what it means to be the church today, uh, how to understand scripture uh, properly. There's been so much change that's happened in the last couple of years. Now, yeah. the problem with that, Michael, is that it you can easily become partisan in your solutions. Mm. And, and we're trying very hard to avoid that. In fact, I've got three core values from an acquisition standpoint that I'd like to talk about. I like yeah. to say that we're high. Our, our books are high on Jesus. They're low on partisan politics and they're biased towards innovation. So mm. um, not to say that we never have a political opinion, but we're not leading right. with that, right? right. So yeah. and, and yeah. we try not to be uh, partisan. As a, as a publisher, I try not to create works that can be perceived as primarily partisan. Like yeah. to me, I want them to be about Jesus first. Right. Um, you know, and then then you have some things that consequently come out, either maybe left of center or right of center, but you're not going to think right. that when you see our titles. Like, oh, this is um, the Fox News book of the CNN book, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that I would mean, be like the worst. Like if I did yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> I'd be missing my target entirely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then and then lastly, that bias and innovation is critical because I, I do think and, and you may know this from some of the work that we've talked about in the past around creativity. I do think. Yeah new things and innovation are vital to our ability to get through this current cultural moment that we're in. So, um, so innovation is a critical part of that. How, how do you think so many times we see faith-based organizations, churches, nonprofits, they're doing great things, but they seem to be behind the trends a little bit. How, how can you, is, how do you make that shift of saying, Hey, the church should be leading people that that believe in Jesus should be the ones leading the way. How, how do you think we can make that kind of a shift? It's a, it's a completely accurate observation. In fact, it's kind of this old trope that the church is five to 10 years behind business, no matter what yeah. we do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what I try to do in our publishing is to, is to look for our, our trends progressively getting more important or less important over time. Uh, and so I look, I look okay. to something and say, like, like mental health, for example, has been hot for six to 12 months. So the question yeah. then as a publisher is, do I start a new project today? Will it be mm -hmm. hot in 18 months or yeah. will it be done, played out in 18 right. months? Right. Yeah. So that's kind of one of our core questions. And the way I, I talk about that in house is to say, is the, is the thing trending up or trending down? 
Yeah. And uh, and so we try to evaluate that and, and move. So that that's kind of topically yeah. you know, how yeah. we address that. Um, in terms of business strategies, we are in a mode of constant experimentation. So like when yeah. we launch a book, we we spent a lot of energy early on doing marketing strategies, which were like peak 2018 marketing strategies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. we, we would try to, we we're like, we're going to create a landing page and buy some ads and like send them to them and all this kind of, it's all stuff that was worked great pre COVID. And now we're like, mm, that doesn't work anymore. And so yeah. we're, we're trying new things and we've, it, we, it seems to be working. We, we, three of our last four have hit number one on Amazon in their category. And so we yeah. feel like we're starting to get traction on this. I had one guy write me and say, what's your, send me your notes on how you're doing it. I'm like, <laughs> Not going to do that, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, it's a good it's try. You don't get it if you don't ask, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. So, so that's just a mode of constant, constant experimentation and being willing to ditch stuff when it's not working, right? Like not working it, is not working. Yeah. 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 So that's, that means good. being real honest with yourself. Well, and I think you're right. I, I think that five to 10 years being behind, I, I remember I was just talking to, to some people about, Hey, the church there, you know, who's, who's losing people because of the great resignation. And some of them are like, Oh, we're not really there. I'm like, well then hold on. Cause it's coming, you know? And, yeah. um, and it's probably going to get more before it gets less. And uh, you know, which was obviously what Vanderbloom is here to do is help them, you know, hopefully help them not have to hire Vanderbloom. But if they do, then, you know, help them find the right people. But I think it's, we, we don't see down the road quite far enough. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Is this, is this going to be a long standing area of focus and things of that sort instead of just, you know, I, I was telling my team, I can chase squirrels real quick, you know, cool idea, cool <laughs> idea, cool idea. No, let's get an idea and let's bring it home. And sometimes it means, hey, let's bring in somebody that can really help us take that idea and, and then put in those little steps along the way. Yeah. So, so to example, what you're talking about, vocation was hot in like 2013 to 2015, 2016 range. People yep. are asking a lot of questions about calling. And I think it's kind of emerging again in, in light of great resignation. And I and yep. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. I think that's kind of a question for the next few years because it coincides yep. with the rise of Gen Z, yep. uh, you know, in kind of this new world that's emerging. In fact, I, I looked on my phone at lunch and I read an article, uh, I think it was in Fast Company, talking about are we about to move to a 32 hour work week as the standard pro, oh, wow. you know, in the country, because California is looking at some legislation and so oh, they're saying, wow. will this be yeah. national? And so, I mean, all those questions that were once like locked in stone. Now people are saying, <laughs> yeah, you know, are we doing this differently from now on? You know, right. what, what does that look like? So, oh, yeah. so the idea of our time, a work-life balance vocation, I think those are, that's an example of an emerging topic that I actually think will be oh, hotter sure. in two years, even than it is right yep. now. Well, and, and the, I, and I said that, that we have the great resignation, but we also have the great, I'm not even applying. I, I'm going to do my own thing. I, I don't, I'll do whatever I want to do, you know, kind of a thing. Right. And I think it's, it's definitely a, it's, it's, it's not a, not a, just a story. It's a, it's a real, real thing. I mean, we're seeing it all the time and it's, uh, you and I both have, have young adults, uh, so yeah. you, you have young adult children, right? So yep. my oldest is uh, 20 and I've got, uh, two, two in college, two in high school and they don't want regular jobs. None of them want to go work at Chipotle or do anything like that. Everybody's no. looking for, they're all looking for an angle. They're, they're very entrepreneurial. You know, yeah, they, yeah. they're looking for a bigger pay value bang for their buck. And yeah. so, yeah, that's all yeah. definitely a trend. Yeah. It's crazy. My, my oldest son, except during high school, he worked at a little chicken shop called Chick-fil-A, but since college, he hasn't had an employer. Um, and it's remarkable and he's doing fantastic. You know, he's, evangelist going out to churches and things of that sort but he's really you know no part of it is that's what he wants to do but part of it also was a calling i mean i remember when right. he was going to go off to college i'm like well what if you didn't do college and just kind of figured out what you want to do he's like dad god's called me to do this why would i do anything else i'm like mm. okay son you got it you got it and he's, <laughs> he's killing it but yeah i don't i don't know what he would do if you had to have a normal employee employer relationship i think that would be a totally it would just be so different and it's that 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 whole age bracket is just there what's cool is sometimes i'm like what are you doing no you you know but they just see things differently and they're like no this is where i want to go and they just find they found a way to make it happen and it's 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 pretty cool to see pretty cool to see but it's also hard to adjust to um yes. you know yes. and um it's you know here at banner the whole team is here we love being together 
Um, but this is, okay, how do we manage being together? But is there some flexibility? You got to start answering some of those questions and things of that sort. And, uh, and, and it's not going to, you know, remote works for some, doesn't work for others. For me, I'm a big fan of you're either remote all or you're not. When you're, mm -hmm. some of you are remote, some of you aren't. There's going to be too many conversations over here and not enough conversation over there and there's mismatches and things of that sort. But it'll be it'll be interesting to see where where everything kind of takes us and, and what the changes and things of that sort. What are the successes? What are the the, the downfalls of it all? And it'll be interesting to see where it, where it all heads. Yeah, all. yeah, yeah. There's been yeah. so much change in the. I mean, the last two years have been equal to the previous twenty. It feels oh, like this in right? terms of what's been yeah. happening. We are just right. on yeah, just auto fast forward. It's it's moving so fast. And, uh, you know, I think it's good for us to take a breath every now and then like, OK, maybe we won't do any change today. Let's just go. But it's a, we're <laughs> moving at a rapid, rapid pace. And, you know, and then there's some things that don't move. Right. Books are still books and people are still reading books. And we probably always will. Will it always be in paper? I, I do it more audio than I do paper nowadays. But sometimes I need a book to just, OK, let me dig in. Let's sit down and, and take that moment and pause for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Len, yeah. it is so good to see you. So good to talk. I'm excited of uh, what's ahead for you guys there at Invite. And um, I'm really, I, I love the fact that it's not, we're just publishing. The the fact that you're like, no, let's let's build big walls. Let's extend that tent. I'm excited to see what, what happens uh, coming from all that. Well, thanks. And, and thanks for your time today. It's great to spend some time with you here on this podcast. Uh, absolutely. Good to see you, my man. All right.